My name is Kevin Smith, and I am the head coach, president, uh, and the chief executive running officer of a company called Marathon Dynamics here in Toronto uh, that for 20 years has been helping runners improve, primarily through bringing out their best in mind, body, and spirit. In today's installment of Being Your Best Dynamo Runner, we wanted to take a quick look at the treadmill. Uh, over the years, it has become practically a staple for certainly urban runners uh, because it is there, because it is uh, certainly a worthy choice to run on. Um, but as anyone who's spent enough time, sometimes even in just one run on a treadmill knows, it has its detractors, it has its downsides as well. So what we're trying to do here in this little installment is give you some important truths that have uh, distilled down through years of practicing said treadmill running in hopes that your experience on the treadmill can be made a little more effective, more enjoyable. I won't say enjoyable, but more enjoyable. No, it can be. It can be close to that if you pay heed to some of these tips that we'd like to uh, present to you. Um, very quickly then, number one, for most of the runners doing the kinds of running we are suggesting, you probably want to disabuse yourself of that one to two degree percent incline recommendation that you used to see in all the running magazines, okay? Uh, thankfully, about a year to two, somewhere in there, a year and a half ago, Runner's World, who had been purporting this for years and years, finally retracted that recommendation and said, yeah, yeah, no, we're the running physiologists now tell us we shouldn't be doing that. I had been telling everybody don't do that since about the year 2000, <laughs> okay? And that's because I spent time running on a treadmill. And I just knew that at zero degrees for most, zero percent incline for most treadmills in most environments, that at zero was way harder for me to hold pace at than, uh, than, than any run outside pretty much. And I'm including 25, 30, 30 plus Celsius degree weather, okay? where you'd think, well, wouldn't it be cooler in the gym? <laughs> no, it just isn't. And the reason has to do with the science behind uh, evaporative cooling, okay? When we're out running outside, even in high humidity and 30 degrees, the fact that we're moving, and probably not wearing a whole, a whole hell of a lot if it's 30 plus degrees, means that all in every exposed area of skin, we get evaporative cooling from where we're trying and how we're trying to sweat. That's an amazingly powerful cooling tool. When we go inside and essentially stand in place, moving our limbs a little, but basically are anchored in space and time, that, I guess it doesn't kill it completely because you are moving your limbs a bit, but it really saps that, that phenomenon of evaporative cooling. So that as you need it, which isn't in the first minute, in the first five minutes perhaps, depending on how fast and hard you're running, but progressively, relentlessly, suffocatingly, that will be to your detriment, incredibly so. So where holding you know, a certain pace that you found easy for the first kilometer feels much harder by the fifth kilometer and feels like death by t the tenth kilometer on a treadmill, okay? So that's the, that's the reason, this lack of evaporative cooling, that we say go to zero. Okay, for longer runs. If you're gonna run really short sprints or short intervals, uh, there is a biomechanical difference that we're trying to equate for, so sure, go up a half, go up one, maybe up to two at the most. But that's only for runs that are gonna be a minute or two or three long, okay? But if you're gonna do a longer steady run or even a fartlek run that goes on for a while, especially OMP, our version of steady state, or God forbid, a long run, <laughs> well, we're, Hopefully you're never doing a long run on a treadmill, though I know we've probably all tried one, and now we know why. Um, but yeah, use 0% grade. Um, and then having said that, again, sort of as part B of this evaporative cooling aspect, do everything you can to replace that evaporative cooling. Um, have a towel on the, on the rack at the treadmill and use it frequently to mop any area you feel sweat accumulating. That will be a, a, you know, a not bad replacement for uh, evaporative cooling. Um, a sweatband is not a bad idea either, so you don't always have to reach for it. Um, most treadmills in gyms, they often try and put them 
near windows. Now they have the shades here, which is good, but when the nearer it is to window, the nearer it is to sun. Sun with glass, the frying the bugs with the magnifying glass when you're a kid. That's what's kind of going on there. It's nasty. It will, it will make it tenfold worse if you're near sun. So look for the one that's out of the, the treadmill, that's out of the sun that's streaming through the window, the one in the shade. It makes a big difference. You'd be surprised. And then the final tip on that manufacturing evaporative cooling is try, if at all possible, especially if you have control at home in a treadmill or you know the gym you wear at workout really well, like I do, you get a fan. You put a fan in front or behind you, wherever they'll let you put it, at the side if you must. But get a fan and crank it up strong and hard. You'd be amazed how that helps offset this stationary evaporative cooling business, okay? So do all three of those. And then finally, have I left it here? Yeah, this is like part three of this war against the, the stifling heat of a treadmill run, of a sustained treadmill run. Again, I don't know if I'm just being a wimp, but I find that if you have a strategic wig out, I'll call it breaks, for lack of a better term, where you are on the clock, as soon as you hit that kill button, if you're gonna hit that kill button, you know that within 30 seconds or, or shortly, you're gonna be, like a minute at most, you're gonna be back in action, okay? But if you, if you know you have this, it's like an emergency break or a fire alarm. If you know it's there, it's kind of nice to have. It doesn't mean you have to use it, but you know it's there and you might. You might choose to use it. And the, t the way I like to say, you, you, the, the format I like to use it is, let's say you have a, a 10K run planned for the treadmill. No other way to do it, so you had to do it on the treadmill. Okay. Always do at least half of what you have left before you even consider a wig out break, okay? So you had 10K. So you do at least five before you consider hitting that wig out break and get back on and start again. Towel down, here I go again, okay? So now you have five left, so you have to go at least two and a half K or a mile and a half if you, you know, before you take that next wig out break, okay? And then I, once you get down to a, a K or two, you know, depending on how long the run was, don't bother with splitting it in half any further. Once you can see the finish line, carry on and finish it. But it's amazing how up to two or three of those breaks makes it more doable. I've had race pace runs that on a treadmill that I would never have been able to do on a, you know, without the breaks. And yet, ironically, I would go outside and the next week and run even faster, even easier, no problem. So you have to, you know, it's a tool, you have to understand what's going on physics-wise, Thermodynamics, I suppose, um, but it makes a big difference on that respect. On that respect, uh, a treadmill is also a great uh, opportunity, usually depending on the setup, for form study yourself. I mean, you have to be careful, but you can check certain aspects of your own form. It's like cheap biomechanical analysis, uh, cadence checks. Very easy format to check your watch and control whether you use the one on the treadmill or your own. Oh, another quick point. Never trust Garmin's on a treadmill. I know that should go without saying, but I've heard stories about people looking at the thing. I gotta keep my pace. It's like, it feels like a minute per kilometer faster. It is, that's the problem. <laughs> they can't, gen they don't work that way. You're standing in place. Garmin depends on movement. They're estimating based on stride length, typical, and they all, and, and here's what will happen based on my experience running with a Garmin incidentally on a treadmill. But trusting the treadmill for the stats, when you run slow, it will always overestimate your pace. It will think you're faster. It will tell you you're running faster than you are. When you're running really fast, uncharacteristically fast for you, it will tell you you're running slower. You see the problem here. <laughs> That's where you're going to get in big trouble. It's nice to get patted on the back. Oh, this feels easy. I'm just, I'm rolling. But when you want to drop the hammer for intensity workouts or whatnot, it's not gonna happen. So don't trust your Garmin's on the treadmill, for sure. And then the final thing I wanna talk to you about or remind you of is not all treadmills are created equal, okay? So knowing that, find one in your bank of options that generally works, or maybe two, and stick with those. Try never to move from those, as long as they last, <laughs> before they, they blow up in the, in the gym. So. Those are, you want to minimize the, the difference between treadmills because it is vast. I have stepped across so many treadmills and tested them 
It's remarkable. You can feel it right away. Some are harder, some are easier, yet they're saying the exact same thing. One reason, by the way, if you're ever curious, get a grade school ruler, <laughs> that little orange or yellow one or whatever it is, and put it in your gym bag and bring it in. And take that out onto the decks where the treadmills are and measure, stick it on the ground, and with your thumb, measure where you hit the deck at the back of the treadmill. Okay, oh, right there, okay, hold it. And go up to the front of the treadmill, not the front of the treadmill, but the front of the belt before the engine, and check it. I, nine times out of 10, I guarantee you, there's gonna be a difference in the height of that, of that belt, front to back. And eight or nine times out of those nine times, it's gonna be higher in the front. So that's my, it's already set at one, two, something percent in the way they set the thing up. So I'm the nerd that's in there. <laughs> you can imagine the looks I must get as I'm checking with a grade school ruler. Yeah, that one, nope. <laughs> because I, if I'm doing a certain workout, I'm going to feel every tick of those kilometers speed difference. So I want it to be as realistic as possible. Okay. So those are my top five or six. Treadmill tips for you to think about because it's uh, necessary. Yep. I, I didn't make that graphic. That's the problem, you see. It's not accurate on a treadmill. No, it's just, it's a silly thing. <laughs> You're right. 1.609. Yes, I, I know the difference. <laughs> well, what they're, what they're saying is that on a treadmill, one mile feels like 1.5. Yeah, that's all they're trying to say. I think we could all agree with it. One minute can feel like forever. All right, guys, thank you very much. <laughs>